no other name, the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. From the phrase, no other name, you can see what passage of scripture I had in mind when I put this lecture together. I had in mind the words of Peter in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 in his speech to the Jewish leaders. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And it is the uniqueness of Jesus Christ as Savior about which I propose to speak now. We begin these lectures, you remember, by taking as a kind of motto phrase to hold them all together, four words from Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 23, the words, we preach Christ crucified. These words, when you look at them, invite reflection on three things, two of which, in fact, have already passed before us in the four lectures that we've had together up to this point. It invites us first, this phrase, to reflect on the truth to be told. These words, Christ crucified, point to that. They point to the message which was folly to the, Jew, to the Gentiles and a stumbling block to the Jews. At the beginning of our course of lectures, we raised the question, what do these words mean? What are they talking about? How are we to spell them out if we would grasp Paul's thought when he uses them? And we've made three points. They relate first to a cosmic purpose whereby God the Creator is renewing his world. They relate to much more than private events in the inner psychic life, they relate to the reshaping of this whole cosmos. The title Christ points to the person who is at the center of history and through whom blessing for the cosmos comes in. And when speaking of Christ crucified, Paul is setting what he has to say about Jesus in the context of this cosmic purpose of God, what he calls the mystery of God's will in Ephesians 1, to head up, sum up, reintegrate all things in Christ. And indeed, all things will be reintegrated in Christ, so Christians believe, when he comes again. That was the first point. Christ crucified is a phrase which fits into this cosmic renewing purpose of God. Second, it's a phrase which points to deity in the person who went to the cross. If you ask Paul who was the Christ, Paul replies without hesitation, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. This Christ, being God incarnate, is the Christ who is there and so we said, the Christ who is here, whenever his word is preached. He is the son of God, Colossians chapter one, who was the father's agent in creating and sustaining the universe and has now become the father's agent in redeeming it. And this is that to which the word crucified points for it was through the cross that the son of God in whom all, the Son of God, who, who became by incarnation the man Jesus, uh, redeemed the world. We made this point in opposition to those who affirm that the theology which declares Jesus to be divine is a deifying myth, telling us no more than the private and personal significance, the transforming impact which the spirit-filled man, Jesus of Nazareth, has upon those who come in contact with him. And then there's a third point to which the words, <coughs> to which the words um, refer. That word crucified points to the event of the cross, and we saw in our last study together 
how Paul expounds the event of the cross as a substitutionary sacrifice for men's sins. A sacrifice which we needed if ever we were to find forgiveness and acceptance with God. An effective sacrifice which actually does bring righteousness, that is a right relationship with God, to those who put their faith in the Christ who made it. We began to raise at one point the question, is all this that Paul was affirming true? And we began to develop an historical apologetic for an affirmative answer to that question. The historical facts appear to say, yes, it is true. It does appear that Jesus Christ was much more than a spirit-filled man. It does appear that he rose from the dead. It is incredible that the New Testament should be as it is, or indeed that the Christian church should ever have started as the community of the resurrection had he not done so. And this points away from the notion that he's a mere spirit-filled man and provides powerful, powerful evidence for the truth of Paul's declaration that he was divine. So these are the things that we've seen with regard to the truth that's to be told. The second thing to which the words of Paul, what we preach Christ crucified, invite us to turn our minds is the tellers of this truth. We preach, says Paul, one asks, who is the we? It's clear that in the first instance, Paul is talking about himself and his fellow apostles, of whom he says in chapter two, verse six, we speak or we, pro we impart wisdom to the mature in a mystery that is uh, in a revealed secret from God, which God, something which God has now made known to us. And in verses 12 and 13 of 1 Corinthians 2, Paul is more specific about God's work of making it known to us, making it known, that is, to the apostles, for he writes, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit. And there you have the characteristic apostolic claim to inspiration. Here is Paul claiming that the authority of apostolic teaching derives from the fact that it's God's own instruction shown to the apostles and then mediated through the apostles in words which the Holy Spirit teaches. And we noted that when one reads the New Testament, one finds that there is solidarity of testimony and convergence in witness, despite all the different phrases and forms of speech that are used of Jesus of Nazareth, his divine person and his atoning work, the thrust of this many-stranded testimony is one. We might here raise the question, is it only the apostles then who are to tell this truth? We began at the end of our last study to see that as fellow believers with them, it is for us to take our stand as fellow witnesses beside them, proclaiming the same truth, which has had the same transforming power in our lives as it had in theirs. Now we come to the third matter with which, on which these words invite us to reflect, the matter which is going to be our special concern tonight, namely the task of telling. We preach, says Paul, we preach Christ crucified on question when and where, Paul's answer, all the time and everywhere. You remember Paul's phrase in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. We preach Jesus Christ, instructing every man and warning every man in all wisdom. As far as Paul is concerned, every man must know, and he makes it his life work, life's work to see, as far as in him lies, that every man does know. Why, we ask? 
And the Bible immediately comes up with this answer. There is a universal command to publish this good news. There is a universal claim which Jesus Christ makes on all mankind. And there is a universal need which all men share and which the gospel alone can meet. All these thoughts, I think, are implicit in the word must when Peter says, there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The universal command, go and make disciples, is there in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. It's the Great Commission, and it's surely familiar to us all. Go and make disciples of all the nations, says our Lord. Similarly, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says to the apostles, you shall be witnesses unto me in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And hereby, he focuses the thought that this message is to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. The reason why is made plain when later on in the Acts narrative, we find Paul at Athens declaring, chapter 17, verse 30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. This is a message for all the world and must go to all the world. This is a matter of divine command. Then I said, there is a universal claim made by the Christ of this gospel. The claim is, as we've already had occasion to see, that he is the one way, the only way, to the knowledge of God as Father. John 14, verse 6 may here be quoted again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. This is news which all the world needs. For every man is claimed by Christ to enter into the knowledge of God the Father, and those who hear the gospel and decline so to enter will be judged for refusing life. And this leads to the third thought, that there is a universal human need inasmuch as there is no hope for any man or woman apart from the gospel of Christ crucified. Only Jesus Christ brings hope into fallen human lives. You remember how in the letter to the Romans, Paul analyzes out the state of fallen man under law, under sin, under God's wrath, the threat of his judgment for our transgressions, and under death here and now in the present. Death reigns over all those who are found in Adam. This is where man is, and this determines his destiny if he's out of Christ. So says Paul in Romans. And he sums up his testimony in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, where he reminds the believers that when they were separated from Christ, they were without God and without hope in the world. If this is the state of men and the prospect for men without Christ, then it's plain that compassion must be a motive in the communicating of the gospel. We take the word to the world not only out of obedience to Christ, in order that his claim on men may be made known, but out of compassion to our fellow human beings who need this message so desperately. It's a matter of obeying the first commandment, loving our Lord, and of obeying the second commandment, loving our neighbor. It's both those things together when the gospel is proclaimed. So, for sure, evangelicals have always understood the matter. They have seen the call to spread the gospel as a matter both of obedience to the Lord's command and of compassionate service to our fellow men and women. And so, ever since the 18th century, they have given themselves to spread the gospel through the world. 
seeking thereby the world's salvation. One thinks of William Carey making much of the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all the nations, insisting that this was a summons to the whole Christian church and not simply to the apostles, and giving the church that tremendous motto, expect great things of God, attempt great things for God. One thinks, in the last cen- one thinks of John R. Mott in the last century, bringing into being the student volunteer movement with its mottos, evangelize the evangelization of the world in this generation and evangelize to a finish and bring back the king. And in more recent days, one thinks of the Berlin and Lausanne Congresses avowedly on world evangelization. And for 200 years now, this has been a central concern of evangelical people the world over, spreading the gospel throughout the length and breadth of the earth. But in the second half of this 20th century, the obstacles to winning the world to faith in Christ seem to have increased. The world's population is exploding. It's now well over 4,000 million and rapidly increasing. And though by absolute standards, the number of Christians in the world is increasing also, never mind what is happening in countries like England and Australia, the fact remains that Christians are a shrinking minority proportionately in this world in which the population explodes so fast. Proportionately, there is a smaller percentage of Christians in the world's population than there was before. Furthermore, doors are closing, closing in some cases with a resounding clash. Something like one third of the world's population dwells behind the Iron Curtain under circumstances in which the preaching of the gospel is either very difficult or impossible because of the degree of opposition which the government makes to that activity. Furthermore, this is the age in which the ethnic religions, Hinduism and Buddhism in the East, and let's for our purposes bracket with them Islam, which though from one standpoint it's uh, an offshoot of Christianity, is nonetheless ethnic um, uh, in a very obvious sense, These religions are gaining ground, reviving the sense of their own strength, dignity, and potential, and invading the West, seeking to make converts. It does not look, if one judges by figures, as if the gospel is really making headway in the world, looking at the whole situation in overall global terms. And in this situation, one cannot wonder if some at least find their nerve failing them and their minds move to speculations and theories which explore the possibility that uh, the conviction that all have need to hear the gospel, the certainty that Christians are debtors to all the world to share the gospel with all men, ought perhaps to be modified. Is it really so, men have asked? Have we not perhaps overplayed our hand in the past in assuming it was so? What I want to do in the time that remains to me is to glance at three such speculations, none of which seem to me to be acceptable. I'll declare that right at the outset. The speculation first that there is divine saving power in all religions. That's a speculation embraced by liberal and radical Protestants very freely. The speculation, secondly, that within the non-Christian religions of the world, you find what we may call anonymous Christianity. That's a Roman Catholic equivalent of speculation number one. And the third speculation 
is dogmatic universalism, the belief that God will finally bring to glory every rational spirit whom he has made. Let's look at these speculations in order and see what can be said for them. First, the speculation that there is divine saving efficacy in all religions. Whence, one asks, does this idea come? Answer, in the Protestant world at any rate, it is based on Schleiermacher's view. Schleiermacher was the grandfather of liberalism, a distinguished theologian of the early years of the 19th century. It's based on Schleiermacher's view that the essence of religion is the same wherever you find it. That religion is a sense of dependence on the divine and that it's and that this, this sense is the common core of all religions, so that the only difference between one religion and another is the degree of purity with which this sense of dependence on the divine is articulated in words. Followers of Schleiermacher in this century have been the German Trolch, the American Hocking, the German Tillich, the Englishman Toynbee, and the Englishman John Hick, all of whom have argued in their own way that Schleiermacher's view is indeed correct, and God is doing essentially the same thing for men through all the religions that the world knows. Here, for instance, are some words of Toynbee expressing the position, I quote, Christianity is a way of salvation which, beginning some 2,000 years ago, has become the principal way of salvation in three continents. The other great world faiths are likewise ways of salvation, providing the principal path to the divine reality for other large sections of humanity. There is Toynbee affirming his position in dogmatic form. The view of missions which, to which this belief leads is that it is proper for representatives of one religion to go and cross-fertilize other faiths with their own insights, but by so doing, they, are, they will not displace those other faiths. All they will do is enrich them. And it's in these terms that the missionary task should be conceived. It's rather like a situation in which, from different parts of the world, there are any number of airlines that will fly you to New York. It doesn't really matter on which of the airlines you travel, you get to New York, whichever one it is. The uh, food served, the dress worn by the hostesses, the languages spoken on the planes will vary, but New York is the destination in every case. Or you can put it in the way that our theosophy friends love to do, we are all climbing the same mountain, all adherents, that is, of the different faiths that the world knows, and we shall all meet at the top. So was Jesus unique? Only in degree, at most. Only in the vividness with which he showed men the way of openness to God, total commitment to the lure and the pressure of the divine, and selfless living for the welfare of others as one follows the lure of the divine. This, in fact, is part of the view put forward, the view of Christianity put forward, in the book, The Myth of God Incarnate, to which I've made reference before. I think, perhaps, in fairness, I had better quote directly from the book, for I don't want you to think that I'm in any way guying it. I am reading, therefore, the words of John Hick about Jesus. I see the Nazarene, then, writes John Hick, as intensely and overwhelmingly conscious of the reality of God. He was a man of God, living in the unseen presence of God and addressing God as Abba, Father. His spirit was open to God, and his life a continuous response to the divine love, as both utterly gracious and utterly demanding. 
He was so powerfully God conscious that his life vibrated, as it were, to the divine life. And as a result, his hands could heal the sick and the poor in spirit were kindled to new life in his presence. If you or I had met him in first century Palestine, we would, we may hope, have felt deeply disturbed and challenged by his presence. We would have felt the absolute claim of God confronting us, summoning us to give ourselves wholly to him and to be born again. That, of course, in John Hick is just metaphor. It's a metaphor for a new start. And to be born again as his children and as agents of his purposes on earth and so on. Schleiermacher himself could not have put it better, that is a pure statement in 1977 terms of the Schleiermacher position. And if now we ask what John Hick thinks about other religions, well, in the same essay, he has told us quite explicitly, again, in, for fairness, let me read his words. All salvation, he writes, that is all creating of human animals and the children of God, is the work of God. The different religions have their different names for God, acting savingly towards mankind. Christianity has several overlapping names for this, the eternal Logos, the cosmic Christ, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, God the Spirit. If, selecting from our Christian language, we call God acting toward mankind the Logos, the Word, then we must say that all salvation within all religions is the work of the Logos, and that under their various images and symbols, men in different cultures and faiths may encounter the Logos and find salvation. But what we cannot say, note this, what we cannot say is that all who are saved are saved by Jesus of Nazareth. Well, again, this is a pure statement of the position all religions have saving significance for those who adhere to them, says Hick. Uh, it is just an accident of geography that we who were born in the lands where Christianity is dominant have been brought up on Christianity. No more is given to us through Christianity than is given to the Hindu through his Hinduism or the Muslim through the worship of Allah. This is the view. What are we to say of it? One has to say quite forcefully that it's utterly out of touch with the by view of non-Christian religions, which is summed up for us in a passage like 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 9 and following, in which Paul says that the Thessalonian converts turned from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. Or by a passage like Romans chapter 1 verses 18 and following, where religions, the religions of the pagan world, are interpreted by the apostle as in truth so many expressions of apostasy from God the creator. The passage, Romans 1 18 to 23, spells this idea out in, great, in, in very clear detail, and Emil Brunner's way of paraphrasing what Paul is there saying seems to me to be a very fair statement of, of the Apostle's thrust. Here is Brunner then, I quote him. The God of the other religions, writes Brunner, is always an idol. The religious forms of the imagination always follow the law of secularization, either in the form of making finite idolatry in the ordinary polytheistic sense, or in the form of depersonalization in which the idea of God is involved into an abstraction and God ceases to be a person and becomes a principle, that's his thought. If the secularization, the blending of God with nature and man is the first phenomenon, then the core incurvatum in se, the heart bent back on itself, it's Augustine's phrase that he's quoting there, the core incurvatum in se, egocentricity or anthropocentrism, that is the failure to give glory to God, that is self-seeking, is the deepest motive of all the other religions. 
The original sin of man breaks out first of all and mainly in his religion. The essence of original sin is man's apostasy and his inveterate tendency to be absorbed in himself. This seems to me to be a true summary of what Paul is saying in Romans 1.18 and following as he diagnoses the case of mankind holding down God's truth in unrighteousness, refusing to worship his creator, and instead worshiping the creature. If one looks now at the works of other religions, it seems hard to uh, exclude them from the condemnation which is implicit in the, our Lord's own words in the Sermon on the Mount about the pagans who use vain repetitions in prayer, thinking that they will be heard for their much speaking. The prayer of the ethnic religions, and with it the religious practice, is entirely a matter of doing things to commend oneself to God. This has been demonstrated over and over, and it remains true. Despite the well-meant efforts of a theologian like Raymond Panika, who in his book, The Unknown Christ of Hinduism, argues that the morality and the good life of the Hindu corresponds to the saving sacraments of Christianity, one has to say this is really something very different from the life of grace which Christians know. This is the religion of works as distinct from the religion of grace. It's not in the least plausible to suggest that here you have the same essence of religion as you have in Christianity. More might be said, but I must hurry on. I want now to look at the Roman Catholic speculation which corresponds to this. The notion, namely, of anonymous Christianity, as it is called by its leading exponent, Karl Rahner. What we're looking at here is the development, historically, of Roman Catholic exposition of the formula, outside the church there is no salvation. Roman Catholic thinking, as you know, starts from the belief that there is no other church save that communion which acknowledges the Bishop of Rome as its head. Protestant ecclesial communities, as the Second Vatican Council called them, are not strictly the church, although they exhibit certain features of the church. And as for pagans, well, there is no question of their being in the church, at least outwardly. And from the third century onward, for many centuries, the characteristic exposition of the proposition outside the church there's no salvation was that salvation comes through sharing directly in the sacramental life of the one fold, and without this there is no hope for anyone. This view pertained in that simple form until the 16th century, when the Council of Trent opened the door an inch to the pagans, or at least to the unbaptized, by teaching that baptism could be received not only in re, that is, in physical reality, through the actual application of water in a baptismal service, but also in voto, that is, in purpose or vow or resolve. For this, the name given was baptism of desire, and it was held to be a reality before God where circumstances made water baptism impossible. An example would be the case of the thief on the cross who put faith in Jesus, but for whom no question of water baptism could arise. So Trent taught that anyone who in, re any anyone who in his heart desired baptism but wasn't able to have it was counted in among the saved, even though the saving sacrament of baptism had never become a reality for his experience. And then in 1863, in an encyclical, Pius IX opened the door a little further by affirming of pagans, Protestants, and Eastern Christians that, quote, 
those who labor under ignorance of the true religion, if this ignorance is invincible, that is dominant and incurable and yet due wholly to conditioning, not to negligence or ill will or any intention of disobeying God, but simply to conditioning of such a sort as to make it impossible for them to recognize the true religion. Now I'll start reading again, I'm afraid, that uh, parenthesis has stolen the show. Those who labor under ignorance of the true religion, if this ignorance is invincible, are not held guilty in this respect in the Lord's eyes. Unquote Pius IX. Link this with what Trent said, and the possibility at once emerges that a person may, in good faith, through invincible ignorance, reject the true Roman church, uh, of course, in terms of the theory, the Roman church is the true church, reject the true church, that is, the Roman church, at conscious level, believing it to be false and idolatrous, uh, as Protestants did, and many do, and at the same time, unconsciously belong to it by desire. Uh, in voto, you see, they want to be in the true church, but they can't recognize the Roman church as the true church. And this is the line which Roman Catholics from that time onward have pursued in order to explain how non-Roman Catholics can be saved. When in 1949, a certain Father Feeney of Boston taught that all non-Roman Catholics are doomed to damnation, the Holy Office in Rome sent Cardinal Cushing a letter condemning this teaching as heretical and excommunicating any who held it. And that was the end of Father Feeney's public ministry. And in 1964, the Second Vatican Council went yet further along this line as follows, I quote, But if some men do not know the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and yet acknowledge the Creator, or seek the unknown God in shadows or images, then God himself is not far from such men. Those who, while guiltlessly ignorant of Christ's gospel and of his church, sincerely seek God, and are brought by the influence of grace to perform his will as known by the dictates of conscience, can achieve eternal salvation. Nor does divine providence deny the assistance necessary to salvation to those who, without having attained, through no fault of their own, to an explicit knowledge of God, are striving, and not without divine grace, to lead a good life. It is, of course, characteristic of Roman Catholic theology to believe that grace permeates all the life of all men and that the fallen human heart, despite the weakness which sin has brought upon it, has not become utterly anti-God in its inclinations. On this basis, it's comparatively easy for Roman Catholics to say, well, everyone deep down is striving Godward, and God, seeing this, acknowledges it. And this very striving is counted as implicit faith and becomes the means of their salvation. That really seems to be what is being said here. Three years prior to Vatican II, the Roman, distinguished Roman Catholic divine Karl Rahner had put forward the following line of argument. This is a yet fuller statement of what's implicit in the Vatican statement and was implicit in what had gone before. The exclusive claims of Christianity operate only where Christianity is known, Rahner maintained. Non-Christian faiths, which are the combined products of grace and sin, function as legitimate and saving religions wherever Christianity is absent. Their adherents should therefore be classed as anonymous Christians having implicit faith, that is, a disposition to believe what the church believes. And the church's missionary task, Rana affirms, is to make explicitly Christian the faith of the anonymously Christian world, just as Paul did in Athens, so says Rana, by introducing the God who was already being worshipped, though in ignorance. Much thinking along this line, positing a vast saving work of God outside the church's fold, 
appears in Roman Catholic, in modern Roman Catholic theology. This is the kind of speculation which underlies the statement of Vatican II and is treated, therefore, by Roman Catholics, at least in the majority of cases, as being almost axiomatically true. But what are we to make of this idea? It seems to me that the following things have to be said. One, Rahner's idea is speculation and has a thrust quite different from that of Paul's Athenian speech, which condemned idolatry without in any way justifying idolaters. Uh, second, it's a stubborn fact that non-Christian religions, as indeed we've already said, are radically different from Christianity. On Rahner's view, one would expect to find some fundamental correspondence or convergence, but Owen Thomas does seem to be correct when he writes, I quote him, the modern study of religions has made it extremely difficult, if not impossible, to demonstrate that an ideal essence lies at the heart of all of them. The so-called higher religions do not stand closer together than the earlier or lower forms, but they are in fact more sharply divided from each other. The adherents of the other religions honestly cannot see their deepest intuitions fulfilled in Christianity. If you have ever talked to an erudite Muslim, Buddhist, or Hindu, you will know how true that is. There are in fact decisive differences among the religions in regard to the nature of the divine and of human fulfillment. Unquote Thomas, what he is saying is that the facts do not fit the theory. It really does appear that the, the world religions are going off in a different direction from that in which Christianity goes. And a third criticism, if non-Christian faiths are ways of salvation till Christianity comes, but not after, then, as Owen Thomas pointedly observes, it might be safer for the adherents of the other religions if the Christian message were kept a secret. Quite so. The Christian mission would then, you see, be less a service than a disservice to the world. The missionary would have to choose between either the dishonesty of concealing or the lunacy of admitting that the first effect of his bringing the gospel is to destroy a possibility of salvation that was there before. Now, surely this is a reductio ad absurdum of Rahner's whole idea. And then over and above all that, as we saw a moment ago, Rahner's speculation disregards and in fact contradicts the biblical view of non-Christian faiths as being rooted in apostasy and as being therefore manifestations of human religiosity, which are essentially guilty rather than good. I find myself then unable to go along with either the Protestant or the Roman Catholic form of the speculation that there is real saving religion, religion which is essentially of the same character as Christian faith, outside the sphere in which faith in Christ exists. I will concede, and this of course is no new point, others have made it before me, that if God should, by some kind of special direct revelation, bring persons who have never heard of Christianity to acknowledge their sin according to the light of conscience and heartily to repent on it, repent of it, and trust him for its forgiveness, then indeed it would be forgiven and those folk would be saved by grace and in a life beyond this, even if not here, they would find that they had been saved by Jesus Christ. That I readily concede, but what I do not know is whether this ever happens. And in the absence of any such knowledge, I find myself going along still with what Peter said in the words with which this lecture began, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Thirdly, I want to glance for a moment at universalism. A very widespread and popular theory these days, a theory which is put forward as an optimism not of nature, 
as if no man were too bad for too good, sorry, as if no one, no man were bad enough for God to condemn, but of grace. The supposition being that part of the triumph and victory of Christ on the cross was that his death guaranteed the salvation of all men that ever have been or ever will be. It sounds extremely honoring to the Father and the Son to make such a suggestion. And it certainly fits in with what I would like to believe, and you too, I am sure. For I would think there was something wrong with, me, wrong with you if you told me that you really would not like to be able to believe that all men everywhere will finally be saved. It would be very comfortable doctrine. It would take away from life one of the things, one of the awarenesses, which makes all life uncomfortable to a degree for Christian people. But the question is, will the Bible allow us to be universalists? The universalist thesis, at least as expounded among Protestants, takes this form, that all the threats which the New Testament pronounces against those who reject the word of Christ are true, and folk will enter into hell, and that is to say, they will enter into an experience of the kind into which the rich man in our Lord's parable entered an experience of pain and distress for their ungodliness on earth. But this will not be their final state. The universalist speculation is that hell will be ultimately untenanted. Hell thus does for believers on this theory what purgatory does for believers, did I say that right? Hell thus does for unbelievers on this theory what on Roman theory purgatory does for believers. That is, it makes them fit for heaven. And universalism appears as a doctrine of salvation out of what the New Testament calls eternal destruction, eternal punishment, perdition, and so on. The thought is that in that state, men will have a further encounter with Jesus Christ and his offer of mercy. For some, it will be a second chance. For others who never heard the gospel, it will be their first chance. And the universalists are confident that this encounter will issue in a positive response, leading to the transition from the state of chastening distress for sin into the state of final joy and glory. Thus, all men finally will be saved. To focus this, do realize universalism is the doctrine of the salvation even of Judas. And this theory ought to be tested out with reference to the case of Judas, about which we know a good deal from the New Testament. Time doesn't allow us to go into all the details of the arguments which universalists put forward for their view. From the way that I've extended it, you have perhaps already come to think yourselves that it's a somewhat hazardous view to argue on the basis of Holy Scripture. It doesn't sound in the least like anything which the Bible says. One remembers how, for instance, in our Lord's parable, if parable is the right name for it, his uh, story of what will, be the, what, what will be the destiny for the sheep and for the goats. The story ends with the one class of folk going away into eternal life, Zoe, Ionios, and the other, cat, other class of folk going away into eternal punishment, Colossus, Ionios. And the word Ionios in both cases signifies that which belongs to the age to come, which is the last age, the final age, the final state, and therefore it implies endlessness, it would appear in both instances. There are no compelling arguments from Scripture which the universalists can bring, where they can quote texts which, taken in isolation, 
seem to point in this direction, in the direction I mean of everyone being finally saved, the same authors from which those texts are quoted make other statements elsewhere which shows that they at least did not expect universal salvation in this way. Just one example for many from the fourth gospel from the words of our Lord himself. It is true that he said, John 12 verse 32, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men to myself. But it's also true that he said, and indeed he had earlier said, the hour is coming when all that are in the graves shall hear the voice of the Son of Man and shall come forth those that have done good to the resurrection of life and those that have, that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Which does not sound like universal salvation. Uh, there are many more examples of this that could be given if time allowed, and I promise to insert them all in the written, ver in, in, in the written version of this lecture. Then when theological arguments are offered, offered, I mean, as a basis for, con for inferring universal salvation, they run up against obstacles in the biblical testimony. The statement that God is love in 1 John 4 is preceded by the statement that God is light. And when John Robinson, for instance, argues that the divine justice is a function of the divine love, that does not seem to square with what 1 John is saying. And again, we have to face the fact that the New Testament insists that there's no salvation where there's no faith and gives us no answer to the question how, if God's presentation of his love and his gospel to men doesn't move them in this life, we are entitled to assume that it is bound to move them in a life to come. A quotation which goes the rounds, I don't know where it originated, is this. No soul is lost until God has thrown arms about it in eternity and looked long into its eyes. And one can see there what is being said. But the question has to be, could the Lord Jesus in any future life do more to exhibit love to Judas and look longer in, and more effectively into the eyes of Judas than he did in this world? And if Judas was impervious to all that in this world, is there any good reason to suppose that Judas' heart will be any different in the world to come? I don't pursue the argument further. What I'm concerned to show by reasoning in this way is that the whole position is speculative. And what I want to say now in rounding off my all too brief review of universalism is that there seem to be three biblical counterarguments, which so far from being speculative are biblically inescapable, which in my judgment make it quite impossible to entertain the universalist view. And here they are. I put them in the form of questions. One, does not universalism ignore the biblical stress on the decisiveness of this life's decisions for the determining of destiny? Think again of Judas. Said our Lord of Judas, Matthew 26, verse 24, the Son of Man goes as it's written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good it were for that man if he had never been born. Do you think Jesus would have spoken so of a man to whose final salvation he looked forward? There are many more scriptures which point in the same direction. What we may ask is so terrible about Jesus' warning to the Jews in John chapter 8, verses 21 and 24, that if they don't believe that he is the one whom God has sent, they will die in their sins. If they are ultimately to be saved, 
is this a final disaster and should it be spoken of as a final disaster? Why did Jesus insert into the parable of the rich man and Lazarus the detail that between the one and the other in that future state into which they passed, a great gulf was fixed so that no one could pass from either side to the other? Well, there are many scriptures which point in this direction and seem abundantly to warrant what, warrant what Baron von Hugel, the Roman Catholic theologian, lay theologian of the early years of this century, called the affirmation of abiding consequences, the decisiveness of this life's decisions as determining what will be hereafter. Does not universalism ignore this? I think it does. A second point, this is uh, the focusing of a dilemma which universalists, I think, cannot avoid. It is for them to choose on which horn of it they would prefer to be impaled. Does not the universalist hypothesis condemn the preaching of Christ and the apostles as being either inept or immoral? Either inept because they were ignorant that all will be saved and so talked as if all wouldn't be, or immoral because they knew that all would be saved in the end but concealed that fact in order to bluff people into the kingdom by using the fear motive. This is a painful dilemma to formulate and you must excuse its uncouthness, but I want to put it sharply the universalist must settle for one or other of those two alternatives. I leave it to him to choose which. But I myself reject the dilemma, for I reject the doctrine. And here is my third consideration, which again I put in the form of a question. Is not universalism rejected by each Christian's own conscience? Here I quote a word from James Denny, who said, I dare not say to myself, that if I forfeit the opportunity, that is the spiritual opportunity this life affords, I shall ever have another. And therefore, I dare not say so to another man. Nor dare I say so of another man. How could I? I know no answer to that. I find myself then concluding that we would be wise not to put our eggs in the universalist basket. It is an attractive speculation, but not a scriptural one. Scripture obliges us to live with the uncomfortable certainty that folk who are Christless, who live and die Christless, are in some real substantial sense of the word lost, and scripture requires us to make our life's policy on the basis that this is indeed so. Where are we left then and what sort of pol life's policy does scripture require us to make? We are left with a world of which Paul himself says more than once that it is perishing. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, he says, his word perishing is simply factual. This is the state. This is the way that they are. This is the measure of their need. The world is lost. The whole world lies under the wicked one. 1 John 5.19 Men without Christ are indeed without hope. But we are left also with a sufficient saviour Christ crucified, Christ the power and wisdom of God, the risen reigning Lord who in the power of his atoning work and of his heavenly ministry is adequate to meet the needs of every human being and to support men in every situation into which he may enter. This Savior brings us salvation which we may say is man-size, and it is our privilege to proclaim him and to declare that though there is no other name given among heaven 
given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved, through the name of Christ, all may be saved. And he is the sufficient and adequate savior and deliverer in all human need and extremity. We are left further with a sovereign God who, though he owes salvation to none, is doing a saving work through the word in almighty grace to create to himself a people, a new humanity. The gospel calls us to identify with this new humanity as recipients of the word of the cross, as those who for themselves trust Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and with that to identify with the church's mission of being the Lord's agents in taking this word to the rest of mankind. If universalism were true, there would scarcely be a missionary task. There could scarcely be any urgency to tell men of the Savior whom they need. If they didn't hear in this life, they would hear in the life to come, and they will all be saved in the end anyway. But according to the Bible, it's not like that. And believers who know the sovereignty of God working through the word to save sinners must recognize also the authority of the divine command to go and tell, for this is the only hope of life for needy men. So we are left as Christian people with a task to perform. Mission is our usual name for it. Strictly speaking, the Christian mission includes good works as well as evangelism, Samaritanship as well as church planting, social action as well as the proclamation of the gospel. But there is no question that evangelism must come first. I conceive it is a mistake when these two aspects of the Christian mission are made coordinates. Surely the truth of the matter is that the purpose of the good works is to give credibility to the good words, and so by all means to further the message and induce men to believe it, to receive it, to trust the Christ whom it holds forth, and in him to find life. As in Jesus' own ministry, his works of love, healing, feeding the hungry, and so on, were meant to make credible and to confirm and establish his identity as Messiah and God's Savior, and so to draw men to trust him, so now with the church's works of love. I conceive that our Father...